Okay, good morning. It's uh, 9 o'clock, January 6th. I'm Commissioner Ed Rothstein. As you can tell, we're doing uh, things a bit different, um, going virtual at this point. I am in the on the dais, but uh, I assure you there is no one else in the room uh, here. And my colleagues are also conducting this virtual. Um, it does not deter us from getting all the information out to you, and we are going to do that the best we can at all times. As always, before we start, let's uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, as always, let's uh, start with Priority Carol. Uh, I'm asking my colleagues, please keep this um, succinct, and we're going to work hard as a New Year's resolution to keep Priority Carol succinct as we move through the agenda. We have a very lengthy agenda this morning. So with that said, Commissioner uh, Frazier, why don't you kick it off? Okay, I only have a couple pages of notes here, so I'll be quick. I did attend the chamber legislative breakfast this past week. Um, but I thought it was pretty well attended. Large room, they had the round tables, but there were like half the number of seats at the table. Masks were strongly recommended. If I'm remembering correctly, everyone who was not eating or speaking was wearing a mask at the time. So it went very well. And we got a chance to hear from uh, our delegates and uh, State Senator Reedy. So it was well worth going there. I'm glad it was uh, pretty well attended. And um, I'll just stop with that. Keep it very succinct. I'll, <laughs> I'll skip the other two things on my on my agenda. Don't don't worry about it. Commissioner Wentz, I'm sure will step up for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that said, Commissioner Wentz. <clears throat> I'm not sure I know the meaning of succinct, but anyway, uh, good morning to everyone, and certainly happy New Year to uh, to everyone. I hope the holidays uh, treated everyone as, as well as they could. Uh, I, I want to just briefly touch on on uh, on the pandemic. You know, obviously we're still in the in the or we are again in the midst of a of a battle here. And um, let's try to be kind to one another. Um, we continue to see the uh, the uh, rudeness that comes across. I think we all got one this morning again. Uh, you know, this is good. Listen, uh, I, I get it, and I, I think points can be made without being rude. Maybe that should be everybody's New Year's resolution for 2022. Tell us your point, but uh, the name calling, uh, especially on social media, I think I was referred to as a doll stick on someone's um, media uh, site. So, you know, I think we can get our points across uh, without, uh, without labeling each other with these ridiculous names uh, i don't get it um sort of reminds me of kindergarten and i do remember kindergarten we used to call each other names i guess a lot of people like to refer back to that but maybe that should be a new year's resolution uh but anyway we've got to get through this covid thing uh and um, be kind to one another uh, we got to utilize best practices and uh, i think uh, again if we can get through this surge I believe we might see that light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I want to say a huge congratulations. Uh, this sort of is related to COVID. Uh, Dr. Scalia with the University of Maryland Shock Trauma is uh, celebrating his 25th anniversary uh, with the University of Maryland system. Uh, we have got no, 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 can't, you can't argue with this. Uh, we are the luckiest region uh, area in the world uh, as a result of having Dr. Scalia as head of our shock trauma team. And um, the, the benefits we all see are amazing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, I guess getting back to COVID, I, I love all the political strategists that have their opinions about COVID. You want to talk about COVID? Talk to someone incredibly impressive like Dr. Scalia. He'll give you the facts. 
congratulations to Dr. Scalia on his 25th anniversary. Uh, so want to point out, somebody else might hit this, but uh, we are again, the lowest un have the lowest unemployment rate in the state. We are at 3.3% in Carroll, uh, well below the state average as well. So kudos to all of the folks in Carroll that continue to work through this COVID uh, and uh, that, that's a great thing. MACO, speaking of legislative things, is going to go. Obviously, the legislative session will occur here shortly, which we can uh, next week. Uh, MACO, we will be involved, as we always have, um, and um, we will, um, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get through that. Uh, it'll be virtual. And finally, in my district, uh, we're, we talk about solar, uh, there's a new solar array that's being proposed uh, up in District 1. Not as large as uh, the Union Bridge one, but um, it's going to be about an eight-acre array, array up there, ground array, and uh, there'll be more to come on that. So we're moving forward with solar here, too. As succinct as I could do it, uh, Commissioner Rothstein. Thank okay, you. thank you. Commissioner Boucher. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Mr. Swam will probably bring some stuff up while he's getting that. I want to mention that I met with the individuals from Life Bridge for the Partnership for a Healthier Carol. They have a brochure put out to talk about health habits you can have, exercise, and diet. And they're looking for us to partnership with them in the future to do some initiatives for public health as we come out of COVID. It's so important for us to have proper diet and exercise. So I want to thank those individuals. And anyone could go to the website of LifeBridge and get some important health information. And here we have the individuals at the courthouse who gave me a tour of the Child Visitation Center, showing me the condition of the building, some of the upgrades that are involved that we're already involved in, and our engineering staff. I want to give a special thanks to all these individuals for bringing the situation they're faced with to our attention. And in the future, they should come in front of us and talk to us about what we've done for them and some potential forecasts in the future as to what they need. And also, I think I did a tour of the Bear Branch restoration. Do we have any photos of that? That is a humongous project that their staff and uh, Water Resource Management put together. They got aerial views. I don't know if Mr. Swain has it somewhere. I can bring it up. It is so impressive. I walked the entire length of the stream restoration with staff that's up in Commissioner Lance's district. It's impressive. Is so beautiful out there. Is the, here we go. Look at this. This is, I think, the largest project we've done to help stream restoration. And all this affects our work quality. Most of our citizens will have no idea what's going on because it's out in the woods in the countryside. But this is so thoroughly impressive. And I hope we can get this up on our county website to show people the amount of effort that's being put in to maintain their water quality. Because ultimately, this water runs into our bay. And the Chesapeake Bay is the largest estuary on the east coast of, of the continent. So it takes all of us participating, doing efforts like this to improve our, our water quality, because so many of us in this county depend on well water. And this will have a direct impact on our well water. And it's neat, they took old logs and put them in the ground because it helps uh, with the erosion and caps the water to go back down in the soil. So if you get a chance, and this goes up on our county website, please have a take a chance to look at this. I'm so proud of our staff and that department and all the efforts they're doing. Thank you very much. Okay, Commissioner Weaver. Well, I uh, just want to say we went, uh, you and I were at the um, uh, Farm Bureau legislative kickoff uh, the other night. Uh, all the legislators were there talking about the issues coming up and uh, I was very impressive. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, though, um, is we're doing the workshops for ag zoning. I had three people in the room say, we didn't even know about this. We're not part of it. We have to do a better job of getting all the players at the workshops. Uh, what's happening, I think county staff knows about it, but we're not getting the word out to the ag community, uh, the people there to uh, be part of this. And this is uh, their part of the uh, uh, zoning. So I think we're uh, really have to do a uh, going to work on that. I got to call Linda and see if we can't get a better communication started. But uh, really good uh, meeting. I uh, uh, I've talked with some other people and various items. I think I got hit with about 10 different things and walked in the room. But 
Uh, that's one I really want to get out that we have to get the message out to the ag community that talking about your zoning and we have to work on it. Okay, thanks. And uh, just a couple quick things. The importance um, of a couple of events that we do on the board. One is a state of the county that is hosted by the Chamber of Commerce. We are uh, postponing that from uh, it was scheduled for next week to February 20th, I believe. Um, I may be 22nd. Thank you. Uh, February 22nd. Um, and then the other is we do quarterly uh, joint sessions with the Board of Education to share uh, both ideas and have an understanding of um, our paths forward on both of our respective uh, responsibilities. We were scheduled to have that um, this afternoon, and that is now pushed also to February. A good reason for that is uh, waiting for our governor's uh, budget decisions and the administration's budget decisions when it comes to uh, the school system. And I'll just end uh, again, as Commissioner Wentz shared, um, COVID-19 is with us. We get the numbers from the hospitals. Um, the hospitalization um, rates are just overwhelming uh, and we, I believe, have to do our best um, and highly encourage the continued um, vaccines, uh, masks, social distancing, washing your hands, good measures to minimize the impact that COVID-19 is going to have on our community. And also uh, the social media, I'm just, yeah, I'm just tired of it. It's, it's embarrassing. Uh, it's embarrassing to see uh, others, you know, within the community using it as a venue to uh, say just nasty things. It's embarrassing to see uh, folks that I believe should have more common sense in roles of authority and responsibility using it in a, an embarrassing way. Um, and we just have to do better. If there are questions from the community and frustrations, reach out to us, absolutely. We are trying to be as responsive as we can um, to you. If you want direct dialogue, you know, I think the best way to do is interact directly with a commissioner as opposed to bringing us all together. Um, and uh, I know for me and I would expect for my colleagues that they are responsive um, in building that dialogue. Uh, don't shy away from it, just it's the right thing to do. So, okay, I apologize being long-winded on that, but let's get right into item number one, and that is the American Rescue Plan. Act of 2021, Title III Grant Funding, uh, Department of Citizen Services, Ms. Steckel. Good morning, Celine. Celine? We cannot hear you. Gina, can we hear you? Good morning. I hear Gina, do not hear Celine. <laughs> um, I think she's saying she's gonna pop up and pop back in. So Celine was going to welcome you to move forward with this. Okay, I'm gonna um, dive in. Um, so to provide some background, um, in March um, of 2021, the American Res Rescue Plan Act of 2021 was signed into law and provides funding for Older Americans Act programs. Um, the grant period is from April 1st, 2021 and extends through September 30th of 2024. Um, the funding will be utilized to support and expand um, aging services, equipment, supplies, marketing of programs, our congregate meal and home delivered meal programs, evidence-based programs, and caregivers and grandparents raising grandchildren. Um, I just want to provide some information about how the funding will be utilized um, and the different, um, this is Title III, all of our Title III programs, which are federally funded programs. Um, Title III-B supports aging services. And with this funding, um, we intend to utilize a portion of the funding to implement the AARP, Age Friendly Community Initiative. Um, and implementing this initiative in Carroll County will enhance our goal of assisting community members with remaining in the community for as long as possible and diverting them from long-term care placement. Um, individuals, especially older adults, 
of course, prefer to remain in the community for as long as possible. And especially during this time of COVID-19 where, um, and when con um, cases continue to increase. Um, with the funding, we intend to hire the consultants to help us with implementing the initiative. And the consultants will conduct a community needs assessment, conduct focus groups and steering committee meetings, and assist us with identifying um, the domains of livability that we want to focus on. Some examples of the domains of liv livability include um, community and health services, transportation, um, housing, respect, and social inclusion. The funding will al also be utilized um, for printing and supplies, um, equipment um, such as laptops for staff, and installation of new automatic paper towel, um, soap, and hand sanitizer dispensers within our centers and also our administration offices. Um, we also intend to utilize the funding to market our programs and services and also to um, promote co-vaccination, booster outreach, um, and also support our annual resource guide. Um, Title 3C applies to our congregate meals. Um, we intend to expand our congregate meal program by offering congregate meals outside of the senior center setting. Um, and that would involve working with restaurants, local restaurants in Carroll County and supporting them. Um, also purchasing air purifiers for in our dining rooms within our senior and community centers and also um, to market the congregate meal program. Um, Title 3C2 applies to our home delivered meal program. Um, we intend to expand the home delivered meal program um, to reach other areas of the county and individuals throughout the county. Um, purchase supplies for our grab-and-go meals and also to pay for grab-and-go meals. Um, we're still at a time where some of our senior center members um, are not comfortable to come into centers to eat and so um, the grab-and-go meals still offers them the opportunity to have a meal um, each day of the week. Um, Title 3D that supports our evidence-based programs such as Living Healthy, Living Well. Um, we'll utilize the funding for training for staff and program leaders um, for printing and supplies um, to continue marketing the program and also to pay instructors and, and leaders of the evidence-based programs. Um, and finally, um, Title 3E um, is for our Family Caregiver Support Program, which provides services to caregivers who are caring for older adults and also um, grandparents raising grandchildren under the age of 18. Um, we t intend to utilize the funding um, to purchase care packages for caregivers, which will include PPE for the caregivers, um, and also one-time only purchases for caregivers, excuse me, and also um, grandparents raising their grandchildren. So some examples um, would be technology, clothing and household items, um, rental assistance, um, childcare or summer camps for grandparents um, so that they can um, have the ability to send their grandchildren to daycare or to summer camps. Um, safety equipment, medical supplies, med medication and medical services. Um, the breakdown of the funding is as follows. Um, the, for 3B, the allocation is $165,678. Congregate meals, $109,880. Home delivered meals, $164,820. Health promotion, $16,993. And caregiver, um, the Title III E, 51,923,000. Mm -hmm. So the total allocation is $509,294. There is a required state and local match. Um, however, the state required match funds are included in our area plan and the county required match funds are approved um, general fund dollars. So there's no additional general fund dollars that are needed um, to meet our match requirements. So I know that is a lot of information. Um, so of course, if you have any questions, um, we would be happy um, to answer them for you. Um, it's just a great opportunity for us to continue to expand the programs and services um, that we offer um, to the population we serve. Ms. Valentine, I think you give a wonderful report. And I think Director Steckel is very fortunate to have you jump in so seamlessly as you did. I've had a concern about how inflation is going to hit our senior citizens' budgets on our meals. So I'm very happy to see the food uh, components in this uh, award. Have we seen a spike, an uptick in that demand? Well, actually right now in our centers, and, and it's, it's probably due to the, the holidays um, and also possibly in the, in the rise of the COVID cases that um, our, our meals 
scores are not what they were two years ago. Um, but with offering, uh, being able to expand the Congregate Meal Program and be able to offer um, the meals at other locations. Um, like one um, item that we're gonna pursue is working with local restaurants where people who feel comfortable to go into local restaurants can go to a restaurant and have a meal and still have that socialization. Um, the, the home delivered meals, again, the expansion there. Um, currently we serve um, with our current contract that we have um, 51 individuals um, with home delivered meals. Um, you know, however, with expanding the home delivered meal program and you utilizing additional providers, it's going to enable us to reach additional individuals. When we had the opportunity um, with previous CARES Act funding to expand um, the home delivered meal program, it, it was definitely popular. Um, we um, worked with some older adult housing complexes and um, we had a lot of people sign up for that. So um, I, as, as you said, I, I think it, this is again gonna give us the opportunity to reach more people um, in many different areas of the county. I appreciate that, and I'll never forget when I first met Ms. Steckel at the Mount Airy Senior Center, emphasizing that some of our seniors, the most nutritious meal that they can get is coming to our senior centers, and I think that's vitally important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you. Debbie, did you have anything you want to add? I apologize, not seeing you. No, thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Any further discussion on this? I think this is a great this go ahead Celine I'm just excited to know that you can hear me because I know I have another to present so I wanted to make sure I didn't have to modify and move to another computer um, I, I just wanted to emphasize also the the um, the initiative that we're looking to hire the consultant for the age-friendly designation with AARP um, and moving Carol into that um, initiative is going to be a really great community awareness component as well as all the other pieces that it brings um, and we will be working very closely with you as our county commissioners um, to help support that initiative and bringing more information about that in the future as well so that is a very exciting piece of this funding um, that we have that support to help move that forward okay thanks is uh, Commissioner Wentz are you on Yeah, I'm on, uh, Commissioner Rothstein. Thanks. I'm struggling, uh, but I'm on. Go ahead. Okay. So we'll either need a voice or a thumb from you just as we move forward. Okay. Go ahead, Commissioner Frazier. Thanks. I just wanted to say I think this is great. I'm glad we're using this money, especially for the meals and the outreach. And I just think it's something that's needed in the community, especially with COVID and everything. And people are afraid to go out. And with the Omicron variant coming, they're even more afraid. I can understand that. So I think it's a great use of the money. I'm glad it doesn't require any additional funding from us because we already have the what we need and therefore I'm going to make the motion that the Board of Commissioners approve the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 grant application and accept the award. Second. Okay, I have a motion second. Any further discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. Okay, got five oh, thanks. Okay, now let's talk about the approval for the Penmore Building renovation funding. Okay. All right. Thank you, commissioners. Um, I'm joined this morning still with uh, Debbie Stanford, our, our standby grants manager from Management and Budget. Um, also, Eric Verdine um, is with us from um, Public Works, our deputy director, um, and also John Bowers is with us as well um, from Building Construction. And we are, this morning, we are here um, on the, if you recall, on December 16th, you, the Board of Commissioners, approved the purchase of the Penmar property for the purchase of re relocating our current family shelter and also for additional office and operational space for the Bureau of Aging and Disabilities and other citizen services staff. Today, we are requesting approval of one-time county funding and FRF funding for the design and re renovation phases of the Penmar building. The estimated cost for the family shelter design and engineering phase is $225,000, and we're requesting FRF funding for this, pur for this purpose. This project was included in the original FRF funding request that came before the board. And I do wanna note though that the cost estimate reflected here is a little higher than the original FRF presentation due to the supply chain demands um, and the, that caused the um, increase in costs. The second piece of our request is for use um, of $700,000 of one-time county funds 
support the design and renovations and furnishing of the county office space at the Penmar building. This cost estimate also has been adjusted from the original proposal due to supply chain demands increasing the pricing. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Debbie Standiford at this point who will walk us through the estimated timeline for the project so that you have an understanding of how we're moving forward with this and the other pieces of it and the funding opportunities that exist for those pieces. Thanks, Celine. Good morning, commissioners. Um, so the timeline includes first, we need, you know, the acquisition will happen next month. Um, we can start then with the county side of the renovations as long as the funding is available. And then the first step for us to apply for grant funding to, to construct the family shelter is this design and engineering piece. So I think I'm a little optimistic. I know that building construction would love to have two full years in here. Um, so I'm a bit optimistic that we can get that done um, by September of 23, because it will line us up for the grants that we can submit. Um, the two large grants that I think we can use to fund this, and we have used these successfully in past projects. Right now, the DV Safe House is utilizing both of these funding sources. And one is the Maryland Transitional and Emergency Shelter Grant, capital project for shelters, or capital grant for shelters, and then community development block grant. And these come out at certain times of year, so I've, I've, I've designed the schedule so that we are able to apply for those, and we will need the approval of the uh, emergency, um, the Maryland Emergency Shelter Grant before we can apply for the community development block grant, so that's why you see those broken down on the time timeline that way. Um, the legislative bond bill, we can, we can also apply for that. That also may be where HSP comes in and, and is applying as a nonprofit for some of the furnishings that we will need for the shelter. Um, ultimately, if this works out, I would see us starting construction in January of 2025. I will say though, there is a lot of grant money out in, in the world today and the sooner we have a design and we know that we can move forward with this project, we have permits, we have the site plan review, we may be able to take advantage of other funding that will be coming. Um, there, there is a new allocation of CDBG funding under the American Rescue Plan. The infrastructure bill funding has not started to flow to us. So as we see that, there may be some capital funding there. Um, and then if Build Back Better is, is passed. So I'm hoping that we can do this sooner than later, and that would position us for other funding as it come, becomes available. Um, so are there any questions about the timeline or the grants that we are looking to? And, and I do believe that we will be able to fund the renovation of the shelter with grant funding using the purchase of the building as our local contribution since that's already accomplished. I have a question for you, Debbie. Um, yeah. On here it says environment overview. I thought yes. everything we're doing is inside the building and reconfiguring the inside. I guess we're doing something on the outside as well. We are. It's a requirement of the federal grants that we do an environmental review. Um, it's more regulatory review than when you think environmental review. When I first saw that requirement years ago, I'm like, oh my gosh, but it's really a regulatory review. Are we in an airport? Um, flight area? Are there wetlands around that, you know, we might impact? Um, are we, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the, it's been a long time since I've run through one because we haven't had a project for a couple of years, but it, it's just, it builds some, and we need to notify all the state agencies that we're doing the project. So it's just, it takes a chunk of time, probably three or four months to get through that. So I always like to build it into the timeline. Okay, any further questions for either Debbie or Celine? Okay, do I hear a motion? I'll make the motion the Board of Commissioners approve the use of one-time county funds for the Penmar building renovations and the FRF funds for the design and engineering of the family shelter. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion on this? Seeing here none, all in favor? Okay, I, okay, 5 oh. Thank you, ladies. Let's move on, Mr. Ripper. Thank you, commissioners. FY22 Connect Maryland, FY22 Network Infrastructure Grant. 
also um, Mark, I'm hoping he's on. The tech guy can't get on, you know we're in trouble. Okay, I see Mark. Also Mark, uh, do me a favor and um, there was a press release yesterday that we provided to the community about uh, $400,000 that we received. Um, if you can just give us a, a Reader's Digest uh, for that, for the community, that'd be great. Okay, we have some technical difficulties, I apologize. Um, Mr. Ripper, can you hear me? Okay, it's on you. Yeah, Mark. Okay. Mark, mute that list. Just, Commissioner Rothstein is just repeating and repeating and repeating over in my. You need to turn it. Yes, you have the web stream over. Okay. Yeah, get out of the web stream. Get out of that. Okay, hold on. What was that mentioned about the technical guy? There we go. Okay. Yes, Commissioner, the uh, press release that went out yesterday um, uh, was um, something that we actually started back in the spring of um, 2020, where um, the state had a program where people could apply for um, grants to do some community builds and extend fiber. Um, Comcast did win two of those, um, both of the applications that they put in and um, we'll now be moving forward with the construction. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a definitive timeline that I can give you or the public at this point. We're still working with my Comcast on um, getting that figured out, but they have started the internal processes that they need to in order to get that construction complete. So, and I think overall we're looking at about a year. Okay, thanks. Now, uh, regarding and, FY22 and Network Infrastructure Grant. Okay. Um, commissioners, the Department of Technology Services is requesting permission to provide letters of support and the requested matching dollars to Talkie Communications Incorporated and Quantum Telecommunications. Both internet service providers are submitting grant applications to the Office of State Broadband for Network Infrastructure Program in order for the county to authorize the use of the local fiscal recovery funds as a match. The county public has posted a request for proposals and received two responses. Um, both applications have been reviewed by myself and the grants office and both meet the requirements of set forth in the county and state um, applications. If selected by the state, and that's the thing, right now all we're doing is submitting the applications to the state. If the state were to choose um, these grants, the proposed funding service areas will provide broadband for up to 1,206, 1206 unserved households located in several rural areas starting north of Pontypan and ending south of New Windsor. Um, the selected ISP were responsible for the entirety of the project, including the construction of the new service areas and will own and operate the network um, once the installation is complete. Um, with the board's approval, funding for the county match will be met by utilizing county's local fiscal recovery funds already allocated for the expansion of broadband in Carroll County. And you can see there at the bottom, the uh, comparison of the two different um, grants that are being submitted with the dollar amounts that they are uh, requesting. And, and just, so you, I know there's probably going to be a question, um, a good bit of the service area is overlapped by each of them. The reason we're submitting both of them to the state and not picking one is to um, give us a better opportunity of at least one of these being awarded as we move forward. Our talkie communications can you familiarize me with that? Sure, Commissioner. Um, they're actually a, a brand new company here in Carroll County. Um, they've been around for a little while. They've done a, a little bit of construction out on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, they're also the company that won the um, Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, the RDOF um, grant opportunities. And you, that is, you can see on there, some of the funding they're gonna be using um, to do this. So they are a new company here in Carroll County. Um, they are looking to actually opening up an office here, um, having a, a physical presence in the county, in addition to the fiber network, and are um, looking to build beyond what this current grant does, but this is gonna be the first step for them. 
<clears throat> and Dick, I actually, uh, I actually met with that group. Uh, I don't know, a couple months ago. Uh, and Mark, you were in that meeting as well. And uh, they they were a very impressive group and full of energy. And I will say that it it is uh, wonderful to see uh, these ISPs that want to come in here and uh, and participate. That gets us away from the only game in town company that we've been <laughs> accustomed to. And I think this really goes a long way in, in, in getting more of our households lit, if you will. So uh, pretty impressive group when they were here. Mark, I have a question for you. You said that these two co uh, companies kind of overlap uh, what their uh, services are going to be for kind of the same areas, but they don't overlap completely. Is, is that correct? That's correct, Commissioner. Okay. Is there any way, is it possible that both these companies could get the grants? That way we could that, cover more houses? Um, I don't know, Corey. Do you think it's possible that the state could award both of them with the covering uh, similar areas, a large, a large amount of similar areas? I don't think so. I mean, the idea is, is not to have, no, I, I don't think they would okay. do that. I think they would select okay. one. Well, would it be possible then to maybe put a third proposal in there? If you're looking at both companies, what I'm trying to get at, trying to get all these households covered. So if they overlap, let's say 300 households overlap, I'm just throwing a number out there. So that would be awarded to one, but the other company that, that doesn't have those 300 could get, could get the, their grant as well. Uh, so trying to get more covered, that's all. So, well, Commissioner, what's going to happen? This is not the end of the process. We're really still in the beginning of this process. Um, once we get final guidance from the Treasury Department, um, Carroll County is going to be going out and putting RFP out, RFPs out for bid proposals for ISPs to come in and build. So what could happen is um, the state of Maryland can't, I don't think they can take and change the grant requirements that were submitted by the companies and, and do a partial. But the company that did not get the areas that they wanted, if those areas aren't covered, they could come back to us and submit a new proposal that would cover those areas. All right, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Okay, do you want to uh, add into that or are you good? Uh, yeah, Corey, um, you can jump in if I'm, I'm wrong on this, but keep in mind that this isn't just about what applications we put in and how we want to might want to arrange them. Uh, this is competing across the, the state. There's possibly anywhere near enough money to do everything that everybody wants to do. So, um, you know, the, the chances that we're going to get both things awarded just on a, a um, competitive basis is, is unlikely. Yeah, cor correct. There's approximately $75 million in this grant um, across the state. So it, it would be unlikely. And for the internet service providers, um, they can't make money if their customers that may choose between two internet providers, it's difficult for the company. They, they don't really want to go into a situation where someone has a choice of A and B because then the take rate for them is much lower. And I think the state is aware of that. So I think it's unlikely that they would select both vendors for this or both, both applicants for this particular project. But this does extend the county's ability, you know, using these state dollars does extend our ability to provide internet. Um, you know, this is up to $10 million that the county potentially would be spending um, that could be available for other internet projects. Okay. All right, I'm ready to say yay and jump up and down and do whatever else you want to do. The, the, uh, I'm ready to do the ISP broadband uh, dance. Uh, I move that we provide letters of support including a commitment for the matching funds to Talkie and Quantum for their submissions to Connect Maryland, FY22 Network Infrastructure Grant. And if and once the Office of State Broadband selects an ISP, I request the board authorize the use of our local FRF fiscal recovery funds for that match. Second. And I want to thank yeah. the staff for working on this. This, has a, this will have a big impact not only upon Commissioner Wayne, but northern end of my district as well so thank you very much for your work on this any further discussion okay got a motion you got a second all in favor aye aye one, one, thing I will say, 
Hold, hold yeah, on. Thank you, guys. One, one Just thing bear, I will bear say, with me, uh, Steve. Bear with me, Commissioner Boucher. Okay. You give me a thumbs up. Okay, five zero. I apologize, Commissioner Wentz. Go ahead. No, I just want to make it. Uh, I'm, I want it, those that are listening, and hopefully the word will get out. I want to make folks aware that this this funding and the, you know lighting up these households is not going to happen next week. Uh, I think it's very important for folks to to uh, understand that it's going to take a little patience here. But just like with everything else, there is a much brighter light at the end of the tunnel now for making sure our households are lit everywhere. Uh, so I, I want to make sure that, that folks understand they, they need to exercise patience here, uh, but we're, we're working as hard as we can. And Corey, thank you. You were in on that meeting with Talkie as well. So thank you guys. We appreciate it. But we're, we're making progress. It's just going to take some time. Okay, the one for one mark. So now let's go Cisco Meraki Wireless Network Support Renewal. Sure. You're going to do the beginning, Eli? Yep, I got it. The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with Technology Services requests your approval to award the renewal for Cisco Meraki Wireless Network Support to DISIS Solutions in the amount of $135,000. The purchase is being made through a Maryland state contract that was competitively bid and the cost covers a term of five years and is within the FY22 budget and no additional funds will be needed. Okay, not a whole lot to say here, commissioners. You got a, a very detailed paragraph that we cover about 1,460 devices um, with this software. This is our cybersecurity for our mobile devices is basically what we're looking at here um, with these Meraki licenses. Um, it monitors the devices. It helps pr uh, us protect people from downloading things onto the devices that they shouldn't. If your device gets lost and you can't find it, we can use the software to locate it. Um, so it's just the, the full gamut of everything that we have on our hard network um, is here on the wireless network with Meraki as far as cybersecurity is concerned. So, and you do see we got a five-year contract. So that 135,000 is about $30,000 a year uh, for this. And I can attest to the fact that finding your device works. <laughs> Especially if it's in a couch cushion or something. With that, I move the Board of Commissioners award to renewal to Meraki Wireless Network Support to this Solutions Inc. in the amount of $135,367.50. Second. Okay, I have a motion, guys. Second, any further discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. Okay, 5 0. Mark, you're two for two. Eli, you're one for one right now. Let's make it two for two. Thank you. Purchase of one life pack, 15 cardiac monitor, and defibrillator. And Mike Robinson, you're on. Eli, you want to start it off? Yep. The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with the Department of Fire and EMS requests your approval to award the purchase of one life pack 15 cardiac monitor and defibrillator from Stryker Medical in the amount of $33,481.42. The purchase will be made through a Maryland state contract that was competitively bid in the amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. With that, I'll turn it over to Mike. And this was previously approved as our grant, which was a 50-50 matching grant. Um, so now this is about the actual procurement because of the um, price threshold of this. So um, the intent of this monitor, again, will be to go on our shift commander car um, with the intent that we'll have four shift commanders starting around July the 1st, assuming we get all of that approved uh, later on by the uh, commissioners. So in the interim, It'll be added to our uh, training equipment at the uh, Public Safety Training Center. I move that uh, we award the purchase of one life pack 15 cardiac monitor and defibrillator from Stryker in the amount of 33,481 and 42 cents. Second. Second. Okay, got Thank a motion in a couple of seconds. Any further discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. Okay, 5 0. Okay, let's see. Mike, approval to use yes. DFRF grant monies to fund additional staffing through 
CC visa to place three additional EMS units in service during the duration of the Maryland State of Emergency. Okay, and uh, foremost in everybody's minds and daily activities is obviously the current state of the COVID pandemic. Um, looking at our EMS responses daily, responses are up about 30%. But our primary issue that we have is the delay at the hospitals. Um, looking anywhere on average now from about two to two and a half hours up to as long as uh, six hours. Uh, so in looking at different uh, interim solutions for that, um, I met with the CC visa leadership, uh, looked at some of our own data and what we've come up with would be to have three additional units put on daily, seven days a week. Um, we're gonna call these peak demand units. And the reason we call them peak demand units are highest level of uh, responses occur probably between nine o'clock in the morning and between seven and nine at night. So what we're looking at is staggering these units. Um, these units would be assigned out of uh, Westminster, Mount Airy, and Sykesville. However, they wouldn't necessarily stay there all day. We're gonna be working with the 911 center and we will um, do what's called dynamic deployment, meaning wherever we have holes in our system because of the prolonged hospital wait time, we will move one of these units into that area uh, so we can maintain consistent coverage throughout the county. Um, the challenge with this is the fact that our numbers are going up in terms of our staffing currently. Right now we have about 25% of our full-time employees of the volunteer companies that are out on sick leave. And uh, with HIPAA regulations, we obviously can't qualify how many of them are positive, but uh, it's obvious what's occurring. And that's for right now, um, out of the full-time people, we have about 26 people who are out uh, temporarily. Um, the new CDC uh, requirements that are out there will allow us to get us get these people back quicker, but we still have the challenge with no end in sight, particularly at Carroll Hospital Center, with the wait time. So these three units will be placed into locations um, to offset that wait time. So the goal will be as one of these units will work um, 8 till 6 p.m. one will work 9 till 7 p.m. and then one will work 10 till 8 p.m. so that staggered start time will allow us to have that extra coverage during the day um, we're requesting funding to allow that to go for the duration of the governor's declaration uh, then we'll evaluate it from there so the um, weekly cost for this will be eleven thousand one hundred and thirty dollars and that's based on an hourly rate per unit of $53 an hour, which is derived from the overtime rate because currently all of our part-time people are not working any of the slots because most of them work for other jurisdictions. So um, the majority of our part-timers that we could hire back at a lower level simply aren't available because they're working time and a half in their own jurisdictions or their jurisdictions have prohibition. So that's really straining us so we're gonna be asking our full-time people to work additional hours, and we're gonna monitor that closely um, because of the fatigue issues and the vulnerability uh, for illness. So our proposal goes through the governor's uh, declaration, which would be through the end of January, and that's how we derived our total. And uh, Debbie has found us grant money through the FRF and uh, tells us that we're eligible for that um, part of our whole equation with this is obviously the um, units will be applying um, through our billing company to try to get reimbursed for some of these calls. And where that occurs, the companies will have that amount deducted um, from the monies they're going to get. Um, the easy way to do this is just to make it a pass through um, by giving the funds directly to CC Visa and we're gonna be setting up a logging system so we'll know each call that's run by one of these units. Um, so that's the uh, plan currently and we're hoping this is gonna make an impact to try to get units back on the street 
in light of the extensive waiting times, both at Carroll Hospital, but we're going more and more to outlying hospitals. Um, we had a unit the other day, went all the way to Waynesboro uh, to patient because that was the nearest available hospital. So uh, the crisis continues. I Mike, if, if, Debbie... I can, if I can just add, I, I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> and once again, COVID-19 is real and it's not a common cold or anything like that. It is real and people are going into the hospital. So anybody who thinks differently, it, we obviously have a problem. Um, I appreciate the proactiveness. Um, I would expect we're going to have the same issues with the 911 center. We're having the same issues with the sheriff's department as folks are, um, you know, calling out sick. And, you know, I know uh, the sheriff has talked about reshuffling the deck to ensure uh, the best, um, as we talked about last week, um, in maintaining safety and security. A comment is, can we look at hiring people and, and the answer could be just straight up no, I, I have no idea, but my understanding is when folks are going into the hospital from the ambulance, the, uh, the crew that's taking the patient into the hospital but can't leave them because the emergency room is filled so they can't get off the gurney because there's no rooms or no beds because of COVID-19 and hospitalization. So therefore that unit is out of, um, not out of commission, but uh, is not available um, as a resource. Can we backfill those individuals or provide equipment to release those individuals back into the, into the unit or into the vehicle so then they could become available or is that too much of a, you know, uh, yeah, well, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's, you know, um, doable or I, I don't know. Yes, um, we're actually, again, being proactive. We've done two initiatives. The first is what's called the direct to triage protocol that I talked about before. We just enacted that. We got approved by the state to use that two days ago. And that allows us with um, low acuity patients, we hand the triage nurse a paper. And as long as there's a wheelchair or a chair in the waiting room, we put those patients out there. Now, because there are times when there is not, nowhere available to even put them, um, a second contingency we're looking at, we're doing a survey to see how many additional ambulance stretchers uh, okay. we can muster. Um, we would put those over at our um, large garage we have at the training center. And what would occur is the paramedic or EMT who's directly watching the patient would stay with the patient. The ambulance would drive over to the academy, pick up the additional stretcher, and then we could leave behind the stretcher. Um, so even though that takes a little bit of time, that 15 minute turnaround is less than yeah. a four hour wait and it gets a unit back on the street. So we're trying to determine how many stretchers we have available. Unfortunately, because we've gone to a power stretcher, uh, which runs about $28,000, it's not, um, physically responsible to go out and just buy a bunch of extra of those stretchers right now. So we're hoping that with our reserve fleet and with the units that are extra, if we can get enough of those, we're going to start moving those over to the training center and we're going to implement that contingency as well. So uh, we are looking at whatever we can do uh, to free those units up. Because like I said, uh, based on the, the predictions and the data, we don't see any relief of this thing for at least about three weeks, and that's probably a conservative estimate. Right. Okay. So there are there are other options, and I appreciate um, you weighing in on that. And we are certainly looking at those um, to try to do whatever we can. No, I, I I appreciate it. I just see that the again the effect that's going to have on nine one one sheriff's department and you because it's one team. You know, it's not one or the other. Yes. And. Uh, so, okay, you, you answered, thank you. Uh, Director Robin, uh, that the Carroll County Board of Commissioners approve the uh, utilization of FRF grant funding to the amount of $44,520. So, okay, I've got a motion, i got a second. Is there any further discussion? Yes, very quickly, 
Director Robinson, I want to thank you for your leadership on this. I hear nothing but good things and through you to the wound you're holding up and all your staff and the people out there. Had it not been for the long-term vision of Commissioner Williams to put this EMS system in place, we would not be in this position to address it as we're dealing with you at the helm. And the ability for the county to move those resources around under stress is a direct result of Commissioner Williams' vision, so thank you. Yeah, okay. I just want to acknowledge it's just Go not ahead. me out there, as this is in partnership um, with CC Visa and the local professional um, firefighters and paramedics have also had input into this. Um, we're all one team and uh, we're in a crisis and we're working together to do whatever we need to do to assure the citizens consistent coverage. And that's really our goal at the end of the day. So thank you. Okay, Commissioner Wentz. Yeah, just a quick question, uh, <clears throat> Mike. You had mentioned that you were gonna put these at one, three and 12 uh, and, and use, use, utilize uh, those as, I guess, a staging, if you will. Uh, in addition to that, if you see, or can you monitor if there's an open shift at some of the outlying stations, uh, will you be automatically deploying these units so that they just aren't sitting at one, three or twelve? one three or 12 because i know as you know that you know we, we occasionally have openings at five or two or we're at wherever so yes. can you can you do that automatically without uh yes um ab absolutely I, g I get notification by seven o'clock each morning of what the staffing is um, we're going to be looking at that and uh, we're taking one of the cc visa academy staff person as uh, kind of a staffing officer where we're going to make those decisions each day. Um, the other thing is, as the holes occur, for example, if Tawny Town goes to Gettysburg, and we know they're going to wait in there two or three hours, uh, we're going to immediately move one of those units to sit up there at Tawny Town. So um, we're going to call that dynamic redeployment, and uh, we'll be monitoring that continuously during these hours of operations. So answer your question, yes. Okay, and then the only other question I have, if uh, I'm, I'm already assuming that this is going to be, this is going to be found to be incredibly beneficial for our system because even before we were in this this crisis, uh, you know, we were we were identifying that there were holes sometimes two three days a week at similar areas. I know the funding is only through the end of January. Is is the is is there a possibility that we could continue to use uh, those FRF funds? I guess it might be for Debbie. I don't know uh, to go beyond the end of January if this if this program is found to be uh, a positive. Yes, and, uh, Commissioner, to answer your question, as long as we this is a this is a direct result of COVID or either a primary result of COVID or secondary, we can use FRF funds to respond to that. Um, and I, I, I looked at the bottom line before because this is a project that we did not we did not present any projects to the board utilizing FRF funding that was a response to COVID. I think back in the summer, I think we were all very optimistic that this we wouldn't need any FRF money for that. Um, but right now, after the decisions that you have made today, um, and taking out the broadband money because 15 million of this was designated for broadband and I don't think that would change. We still have about $5 million in FRF funding available. And, and so we've had, I've had several requests over this week. I, I, I would imagine that we may bring um, an, another look at this plan back to the board to see if you wanna make some changes to it in the near future. Okay, that's good to know. I, I certainly do appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Mike, for and, and obviously CCV. So everybody's all in on this, and, and I think this is a great uh, this is a great decision moving forward. Uh, so I certainly do appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Seeing here none. All in favor? Aye. <clears throat> Five zero. Thank you very much, Mike. Okay. okay. Thank you, commissioners. Let's move on to Mr. Daggett's and what do we got? Land and Sea Burns Park Octopus Climber. 
Okay. Go for it. Go ahead, Eli. The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with the Department of Recreation and Parks requests your approval to award the contract for the purchase and installation of playground equipment, safety surfacing, and related work at Landon C. Landon C. Burns Park to Playground Specialist Inc. in the amount of $98,076.60. This project was competitively bid and the counter received four responses listed below. The committee reviewed the proposals and selected the vendor and product. This amount has been the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary and 100% of this project cost is supported by the state of Maryland's local park and playground infrastructure funding that was included in the department's FY22 capital budget. With that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. <clears throat> Jeff. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, we're really excited about this particular equipment. This is something unique. Uh, it's not a standard uh, play equipment by any means. You all have a picture of it, I believe, that you can see on your screen. And uh, basically, this gives the visual appearance of an octopus rising out of the water. You see the net area, which provides some climbing opportunities. And there's opportunities to climb each of the individual tentacles, if you will, of the octopus. So it, it's very unique looking. And I think it's going to generate a lot of interest and a lot of play value. And we're very excited to be adding this <coughs> to Landon Buttons Park. I'd be happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. Okay, thank you. It looks like a lot of fun. Is there a height restriction on commissioners to use it? <laughs> Depends on which area. <laughs> I'm not sure about the net. I don't know that I'd want to try the net. <laughs> well, where on the, the lot is the restriction? Has that been, been determined yet? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that question. I'm sorry. Where on the property you want be located, or is that uh, to be determined? It'll be located about halfway between an existing picnic pavilion and our ball field. So it, it's very close to the level, the centers of activity for the park. It's a nice visual location. And it's also a very short distance from the parking lot and, and uh, walking trail that'll connect to it. Good, thank you. If it gets complete before I finish my term, I'd love to go out there with you, take a look at it and get some photos. Thanks. Absolutely. I move that the Board of Commissioners award the contract for the purchase and installation of their playground equipment at Landon C. Burns Park to Playground Specialist Inc. in the amount of $98,076.60. Second. Okay, I got a motion <clears throat> and I got a second. And uh, the only comment I want to make is um, we talk about safety, security, and quality of life, even through these very challenging times. And we're going to get into stormwater management in a second, which is not nearly as um, overt and exciting as some of these activities, but it's all about quality of life for our community. So I appreciate keep moving forward. Um, any comments, discussion on this? Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Commissioner Weaver? You good? Okay. Thank you very much. I apologize. You seconded anyway. Okay. Get back to work. Now let's talk about stormwater management, Stone Manor, stormwater management facilities retrofit. Yep, I think Carrie is out this morning, so I'm gonna be taking her stuff for her. So uh, the Office of Procurement in conjunction with the Bureau of Land and Resource Management request your approval to award the contract for the Stone Manor number one stormwater management facility retrofit to Hamilton Site Construction Inc. in the amount of 264,100 dollars and zero cents the office of procurement issued an invitation for bid and received 12 responses listed below with hamilton site construction inc being the lowest responsive responsible bidder okay good morning commissioners <clears throat> i wanted to introduce ed stinger who's with us as our watershed management coordinator this will be Ed's first project, um, taking through the construction process to meet our MPDS permit requirements. That's good to meet you, you uh, Commissioner guys. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I heard Commissioner Rostein say that it's, um, you know, it's not as exciting as uh, playground equipment and, and things of that nature, but these, uh, these stormwater retrofit projects are not only important because uh, 
to help us meet the requirements in our MTDES permit, but uh, also um, really uh, improve the water quality in our, our streams and waterways that uh, ultimately end up in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I, I know I, I saw uh, Commissioner Boucher talking about the, the stream restoration up in uh, the western part of the county this morning. Um, so we're, we're, we're essentially asking for approval for, for, the, uh, for this project to go forward with this bid uh, to retrofit the uh, Stone Manor project, which will um, provide uh, better water quality treatment to, uh, to a 19.37 acre watershed with 5.63 acres of impervious uh, area. Mr. Singer, it's good to have you back and something so exciting. And I'd like to thank former director Devilbitch for turning me on to this dirty subject. Now I'm falling in love with it because I get to go outside. If at all possible, as this thing starts to unfold, I'd like to go out to the site with you potentially and see it. I, I guess this is in uh, Commissioner Frazier's district. I'm not positive, but I see Mount Airy as the contractor. So I'd like to make the motion that the Board of Commissioners award the contract for Stone Manor number one SWM facility retrofit to Hamilton site construction in the amount of $264,170. Second. Okay, I have a motion, I have a second. Is there any further discussion on this? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 5 0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Bear with me. Okay, let's talk about protocol system maintenance for calendar year 2021, emergency medical EMD and fire EFD and police EPD dispatch. Okay, Scott. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, we have a straightforward request of you. We have a $36,000 bill to be paid to Priority Dispatch, they are the vendor who provides these uh, protocol systems that uh, Mr. Brown's operation utilizes in the Emergency Communications slash 911 Center. Um, this is a, a uh, recurring annual maintenance agreement that maintains these protocol. And uh, as I note in the brief, this is an expense that is in fact eligible for and we absolutely expect to be reimbursed by the Maryland 911 board. Uh, as part of that funding from the board, it is required to adhere to local procurement requirements, which is exactly why we're here today to request your approval to, uh, to spend the $36,000. If you have any questions about uh, how these protocols work or how they, uh, they fit into the operations or possibly about the reimbursement process, I'm sure that Mr. Brown uh, can answer those questions for you. Hey, uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, Jack, I know uh, 804 and 808 were out uh, yesterday. I think is this part of that, or is that, or is that something else? Something That's else. That's something different. There was a there was a technology glitch with the uh, with the console that operates operates that that was corrected yesterday afternoon by the radio repair folks. Okay, so this this is uh, this maintenance is for. Uh, these, are, these are our call taking protocols. So as, as the as the caller dials nine one one, we'll use these medical, fire, or police protocols to process that that nine one one call. And this is where the pre arrival instructions and all the safety um, safety information comes in as well. Okay, got it. Thank you. Well, in the interest of any other further discussion, I'll make the motion that we authorize the director of public safety to pay the annual fee out of his own pocket. Can I add that to the, to the, uh, okay. Maybe I shouldn't add that. I, I, I don't think that was in the, my, in the, the uh, agency's well, recommended, but, but I thought I'd give it, I thought I'd give it a shot, Scott. Uh, I moved that, the, that we authorize director of public safety to pay the annual fee for the reference protocol system maintenance agreement. Second. Second. Okay. Got a motion. Got a couple seconds. Any further discussion seen here? None. All in favor. Aye. Five Oh, okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Hey, Ed, Ed if Thank you will allow me for one minute, you brought this up earlier while we've got Jack on here. And, uh, you know, kudos to Ed for bringing this up about the one team effort. Often the dispatch, which is the first line of defense, the first line are overlooked. So I'd like to take this opportunity to 
and especially since Ed brought it up, to make sure that you pass along our thanks to all those that are working uh, over there at uh, 911 for everything that uh, that they're doing throughout this uh, pandemic too. You know, honestly, for me, it while while we're getting called names, the electeds, and uh, you know we're we're getting we're getting ridiculous things thrown at us. Uh, luckily, I haven't seen that happen to our first responder community or our 911 and everybody else yet. So uh, I, I want to thank you for all of that. Uh, hopefully that won't happen. Um, maybe they'll just keep calling us doll bulbs and, and uh, sticks or whatever they call us instead of you guys. But make sure you pass along the thank yous to everybody over there. And uh, Absolutely. Thank you very much. as important also, make sure we understand the requirements. So if there are folks <clears throat> that are challenged or sick leave and issues, and you are in a really tough situation, you gotta let us know, um, you know, sooner rather than later, uh, because it's gonna get worse, you know, and we know that. And regardless of what the community may say and others may, you know, share, again, from levels of what they think are, you know, understanding, um, I, I need to know from you, uh, and when I say I, we, along with the fire and uh, and uh, sheriff's department, you know. So please keep us informed. So, but thank you. Absolutely, okay. thank you very much. Let's move on to uh, DPW and um, looking to request approval for changes to Chapter 170 of the Construction Codes, Jason. Morning, Commissioners. Uh, on December 16th, the public hearing was held to change electrical licensing within Chapter 170 to electrical registration due to recent changes to state law. Two minor, two minor editorial changes were also included with that proposal. Uh, the record was left open for 10 days and no additional comments have been received. So we're here today to seek your approval. Okay. I'll make the motion that the Board of Commissioners approve the changes to Chapter 170 of the Construction Codes second okay i hear a motion i got a second any discussion all in favor aye four zero and one absent okay let's move on to purchase of census i pearl residential water meters and meter transceiver units The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with the Bureau of Utilities requests your approval to award a contract for the purchase of 400 census high pearl residential water meters and 918 water transceiver units to LB Water of Southern Grove, PA in the amount of $260,101.94. LB Water is an authorized distributor of census products within the state of Maryland and this cost is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. Nothing for the end. Good morning, gentlemen. This item is for the final bulk purchase of the Census I Pro water meters as part of the upgrade program initiated by the Bureau in 2013 to replace the county's aging residential water meters with the I Pro model. As you are aware by previous open session items, this upgrade program also transitions the older water meters from the inside of the residences to the installation of the I Pro model in an outdoor meter pump. This time about 750 of, of the residential accounts remain to be upgraded to outdoor vaults and high meters. We, we expect to fully complete this over the next three fiscal years. The uh, census i pro water meter contains no moving parts and maintains accuracy over the projected 20 year service life. The meter transceiver unit allows staff to, to remote read the, the water meters. Um, as per the briefing paper with current supply chain issues, be aware that the current lead time water meters is about 20 weeks and the lead time for the transceiver units is 40 weeks so it, it, it's imperative that we place this order as soon as possible with that are there any questions for me is this in a is this the freedom area or is this across the county the the meters have been uh, upgraded in all of our service areas but, but the remaining ones for this purchase are for the freedom people yeah that's what i figured Okay, I'll move to the Board of Commissioners award a contract to purchase a 400 census I Pearl residential water meters and 918 meter transceiver units to LB Water in the amount of 
$260,101.94. Second. I got a motion, got a second. Any discussion on this? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 5 0. Okay. Now let's talk about. Oh, cool. Johnville Road. Building construction, uh, looking for approval for additional funds for the Safe Routes to School SRTS project for Johnsville Road, located in Eldersburg. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, we're here this morning to request your approval uh, of resolution number C2210, transferring $1,400. $20 from Public Works unallocated to uh, John's Road Sidewalk Project number 8587. Uh, with me, I have Kirk McGowan. He will be uh, giving you a briefing on, on what the details of that entail. Morning, Commissioners. Uh, we would like to give you a brief recap of the project. Uh, this project is for the construction of an 800 foot public sidewalk along Johnsville Road connecting to Ellersburg Elementary School, Liberty High School, and the residential neighborhoods. This project is funded through the Safe Routes to School program, which is, which is administered by the Maryland Department of Transportation. 80% of design and construction is funded by the Federal Highway Administration. The county funding responsibility is 20%. After going through the state bid process, Maryland Department of Transportation approved the lowest bidder to J Villa construction in the amount of 319,000. This is actually 13% lower than the latest engineer's estimate of 370,000. However, the original memorandum of understanding funding cap issued for this project was at 255,000. Based on the actual costs received through the bid process, it has left a funding shortfall for the state and county. A project modification letter was sent to the state requesting additional funds to complete this project for their 80% portion on October 28th of last year. On December 17th, Maryland Department of Transportation approved increasing the federal funding cap to 305,000. <coughs> the remaining 20% County portion being requested today is $12,420. The anticipated start date for this project is the beginning of March or thereabouts. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, actually, you just uh, answered the, uh, the timeline, so I really appreciate that. Uh, how long will it take yes, to finish? We're approximating about two months. Oh, wow. I really in all honesty, yeah. in all honesty, if it wasn't going through the SHA, uh, you know, process, which is the umbrella of the project, um, you know, it, it could be done quicker. But um, going through the <coughs> inspection of materials and everything being approved, uh, everything that we submit or put forth has to be approved by you know the Maryland Department of Transportation. So that through the inspection process and so forth that they regularly will be doing and conducting. Uh, it does take longer than what you would typically think uh, a 800 foot sidewalk would take. Yeah, I, I appreciate the uh, persistence and I know uh, Commissioner Frazier and I both highlight um, sidewalks within our communities that, you know, need to be completed. And uh, every chance we get, um, and I think all of my colleagues reach out to uh, MDOT saying, hey, this is a program that really needs to be uh, used in Carroll County because there are still schools without sidewalks. And, uh, you know, so I, I appreciate the work you're doing. It definitely uh, it meets our intent. Commissioner Frazier, do you uh, want to add to that or? Yeah, I do. Thank you. I, I, I'm very appreciative. This is moving forward. I'm glad to, uh, I mean, like uh, Commissioner Rothstein said, I think every time we met with this, the State Department of Transportation, I know I brought it up and others said, well, we want sidewalks around our schools so, so students can walk safely back and forth from the from the residential neighborhoods that are there. This is another big step forward, no pun intended, um, to getting that done. And I'm, I'm so happy that, that we're doing this. I really am. Anytime that we can get 
sidewalks around schools and move them out it's just big step big safety step for the for the community and with that i read the motion here i move that board of commissioners approve the additional county funds needed for the johnsville road safe schools safe routes to school sidewalk project in the amount of twelve thousand four hundred and twenty dollars i will second that uh john for bowers sure did you uh you're lit up did you want to say and, something john um sorry commissioners no i just hit the wrong okay i apologize uh commissioner weaver i, I do want to say that these things should happen with every housing development sidewalk should be a part of every plan being submitted we were delinquent in that years past and that's why we're in the going back and retrofitting these sidewalks but any houses i think planning and zoning approves in the future our system should have sidewalks as a part of the program absolutely agree yes Commissioner. Commissioner, uh, I, would, I would also like to say that yeah um the maryland department of transportation when they sent their approval letter was very complimentary of carroll county um and us utilizing the safe for us to school program because not everyone out there is using these monies in which to do this to not only have the sidewalks for safety for kids to be um you know walking back and forth between their homes and, and, and the schools but um mm -hmm. to have them ada compliant as well so um so thank you for your support and we've been uh highlighting uh m dot and just uh again uh, a great thank you to the outgoing secretary uh, greg slater who's definitely been a friend in court and congratulations to another friend in court with secretary jim ports uh taking the lead in uh m dot if people haven't heard and uh just in saying that with commerce uh secretary mike gill is returning to the helm and uh secretary kelly schultz has now let go of the reins uh for secretary of commerce just in fyi any discussion, further discussion on this sidewalk issue? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 5 0, thank you. Now let's talk about purchasing reflective glass beads. Thank you. Okay. Eli? Didn't we have, a, did, didn't we have to? Uh, I was just letting you know more of that purchase. I, I apologize. Gonna... Say again, Commissioner Wentz. No, we. I think we have to award that contract now for the sidewalk thing. Um, that's all I was saying. Oh, I, I apologize. That's correct. Uh, he, no. Eli is part of too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. That's right. Now, go ahead, Eli. Okay. So the Office of Procurement in conjunction with the Bureau of Building Construction requests your approval to award the contract for the Johnsville Road sidewalk improvements to Jayville Construction in the amount of $319,100. The project is part of the Safe Route to Schools project and consists of construction of a sidewalk along Johnsville Road connecting to various local schools and residential neighborhoods. The project was 80% funded by the Maryland Department of Transportation, leaving the remaining 20% to be funded by Carroll County. The funds are within the adopted budget that was approved prior to this request and no additional funds will be necessary. Since we basically already just talked about this, <laughs> uh, the motion of the Board of Commissioners awarded the contract for Johnsville Road sidewalk improvements to J. Villa Construction Incorporated in the amount of $319,100. I'll second. Sure. Okay, got a motion, got a couple seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Wance. Stand me straight. Any uh, comments further? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 5-0, okay. Now, see, I was all excited to get to uh, to Mr. Brown. Let's talk about purchasing glass beads. The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with the Bureau of Roads requests your approval to purchase 132,000 pounds of glass beads from term contractor Potter Industries in the amount of $47,124. The purchase is being made through a Baltimore County contract that was competitively bid and the amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, and uh, in 2021, you remember that we had uh, significant issues uh, with purchasing glass beads and painting and had to come before you for contractors. I will 
uh, give uh, rounds of applause to Kathy Birch for getting out in front of this this year and working with Eli, uh, getting this on your agenda early uh, so that we can have our items in, uh, hopefully ahead of everybody else for our 2022 painting season. Uh, these glass beads will go, uh, if approved, in the paint that is coming up uh, next uh, to provide additional reflectivity for all of our motors to Carol Street. Um, just a couple questions. Well, hopefully we can get the paint because I know that was an issue. Uh, I know that's next, but um, this this is a great opportunity. I, I, I assume they use recycled glass for this, uh, which is something. Yeah, I, I think we've talked about that before, Jim. And thank you to uh, Kathy for, for taking the, the lead on that and getting us there. But uh, I've seen roads where they've actually used these glass beads in the paving. Uh, have we looked at that? Or is that something that, that we haven't really, I mean, that, apparently it's used as a safety issue other than the paint. Have you guys ever seen that or not? Uh, yeah, I have I have seen that in there. Uh, we have not looked at it uh, yet within, uh, within Carroll County, uh, obviously. Uh, or at least in our roads operations, engineering uh, may have reviewed that, but I can't answer that specifically, sir. But I can check into it. For you. Okay, it's just a just a thought. And if, wouldn't it be great to be able to harden as we harden all our gravels to make them all shine? <laughs> I, I did see that uh, in Baltimore. It's a little bit like tar and chip. First snowstorm, a lot of those glass beads are gone. Uh, I. I Gee, I, was, uh, I can't remember where it was now. I thought, wow, look at that road. So, and it sparkled part of it, but the rest of it was uh, disappeared. So, maybe, maybe that sparkling was your uh, your personality. I don't know, but just saying. Okay. So, based on that, I'm going to rapidly move to the motion, which is. Uh, approving the purchase of 132,000 pounds of glass beads from Potter Industries in the amount of $47,124. Hey, that's not, the, that's not the Mr. Potter from It's a Wonderful Life, is it? It can be if you wanted to. If, it's, if it is, I'm not voting for it. If that's right. The envelope of money. Okay, I got a motion. I'll second. Any further discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. Okay, let's move on to purchasing traffic paint. Gentlemen and ladies. The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with the Bureau of Roads requests your approval to purchase 8,725 gallons of yellow and 8,725 gallons of white traffic paint from Ozark Materials in the amount of $162,372.25. The purchase is being made through Maryland State contract that was competitively bid and the amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. <clears throat> so uh, the glass beads that were just approved uh, go into this paint uh, for reflectivity. Uh, here in Carroll County, um, we uh, have a yearly goal to repaint all of our yellow or center lines every year and then our white edge lines every other year as well as maintaining any new construction or other projects that engineering or roads may have, uh, whether it be an overlay or a mill and fill or any other project that requires lines to be put back. Uh, we have our own team and machine uh, in the county. And again, after, after uh, the contracts that we went through uh, last year, I know you all understand that we do it much more cost effectively here. So uh, we're asking for your support in purchasing it. Doug, I do have a question for you. What is the standard for repainting these lines? Does everybody do it every year for yellow and every other year for white? Are we ahead of the game on this? And, and is it really necessary? So it is really necessary. Um, and uh, I think most jurisdictions do try to repaint their yellow uh, every year. It's critical to uh, show our folks where the dividers are and even more so in our area, depending upon the winter that we have. Uh, as you get down and put uh, abrasives and other things on the road, uh, plowing, uh, it, it's key as a safety factor uh, to keep keep that center line in there. So I would say uh, yes, uh, it is the norm and uh, 
But if you look at some other jurisdictions, uh, you don't have to go far uh, to say that our folks do a great job at keeping our roads uh, painted because the point is, why have a line uh, unless you can see it? And uh, there, there are a lot of places around when you look, you're like, man, that could really use a shot of paint. And uh, um, we, so we are a bit, I, I would like to say, not I would like to say, I know that our team is out there looking every day and keeping our stuff above grade so that we can shine brightly. So I'll leave it at that. Deputy Director Brown, thank you. I just want to state that the older I've gotten, so to speak, at night or rain, I have more difficulty seeing the lines myself. So if I'm experiencing or lots of other people are experiencing. So this is a big safety feature to help people as they age recognize the lines on the road. So thank you. I'll move the Board of Commissioners approved the purchase of 875 gallons of yellow and 8,725 8, gallons of uh, white paint uh, from the Ozark materials in the amount of $162,372.25. I did get that at 8,725 gallons of yellow, I hope. So, okay. I'll second the correction. Okay, I got a motion that was amended and a second. Uh, any further discussion on this? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 5-0. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna move into uh, open admin. Uh, gentlemen, please take a look at the uh, summary of the closed minutes and I need a Motion to approve regarding land acquisition. And uh, close minister from 1216, December 16th. I move Make we approve. Go, go ahead. Okay, I move we approve the uh, the closed minutes from uh, 1216. I will second that. Okay, I got a motion. Thank I you, got a second. Further discussion on this? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 5-0, okay. Before we get into uh, agendas, open admin, I got a couple things, one informative and one action. Uh, the informative is, as Commissioner Weaver shared, it was a pleasure and uh, an honor to uh, talk at the farm farmer's uh, uh, reception, the dinner the other night and uh, most importantly, learning that is now Commissioner Dickey Weaver, he should be referred to as opposed to Commissioner Dick Weaver. I was unaware of that, but uh, as he was introduced, it is uh, Commissioner Dickey Weaver. So thank you very much. Um, is that a motion, Commissioner Rusty? That is a motion that he should now be referred to as Commissioner Dickey Weaver from this movement forward. Second. We were seven years old at the time. So. I'm not saying how you should act. I'm saying what you are. So, okay. Second, second, second. <laughs> okay, now for action. <laughs> so regardless there, uh, Commissioner Weaver, you have now lost. So it's at least four with, I'll just say, in abstention. Um, for action, the Baltimore Sun, and uh, Commissioner Wentz, you brought this up. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's some dickies we can <laughs> purchase. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Squam. Um, the Baltimore Sun had an article and uh, Mayor Scott, I think, was either quoted in it or was referred that Carroll County was going along with the other counties in looking at a regional vaccination passport. Um, I wanna make it very clear that that is not what we're doing, nor were we ever consulted with. Um, we have from day one talked about not having mandates within our community. If it's uh, good with you, I can take action on this um, and go back to the Baltimore Sun for clarification and correction. So, um, so we did um, um, ask for a, a correction and they have agreed to do so. So I don't know if the uh, article has been updated yet, but they, they were, uh, the, uh, the author of the article, uh, the reporter was um, willing to do so. But I didn't know if you wanted to do anything farther with it, some kind of statement. Well, if necessary, order. we can, but go ahead, Commissioner Wance. No, I think your statement is fine, Ed. 
uh, it's interesting to me that it's always been referred to as the Big Seven, and apparently Baltimore Sun now thinks we're part of that and has made it the Big Eight. Yeah. While I think we certainly all appreciate the fact that we're big and uh, that we, you know, we're, we're loud and proud here, uh, I think it was a, a it was an honest mistake by the Baltimore Sun, and I think your statement today and the fact that our uh, uh, public information uh, officer reached out to them is, is enough. Okay. Uh, but yeah, thanks. Okay. And it is going to be challenging times. I mean, that's the facts. We have Frederick on the uh, left and Baltimore County on the right and Howard County to the south. And we know how their dialogue is happening. So we just have to be aware of that. Um, and I, I appreciate that being brought to my attention. So thank you, Roberta. Um, is there anything else more for open admin for this morning? Okay, let's go on into agendas. And we're going into the middle of January. <clears throat> I'm here. Okay, Wanda, thank you very much. My camera's not working now, but I'm here. Well, personally, I hope that was working for some of my colleagues, but you know, that's a different story. On Monday, January 10th, we have nothing on the 11th. We have the, no, that will be corrected. The state of the county will not occur on the 11th. Um, on 2.30 p.m., we have MACO Tax Subcommittee meeting, virtual with Commissioner Wance, and legislative meeting with uh, MACO, Commissioner Frazier, and Wance. The Ag Center board meeting, I'll be attending that evening on the 11th. On January 12th, Wednesday, Opioid Prevention Coalition, Commissioner Frazier will be attending virtually, and I will be attending the Economic Alliance Greater Baltimore board meeting uh, virtually that afternoon. Excuse me, Commissioner Weaver will have the opportunity and honor to uh, represent us at the Board of Education board meeting uh, that late afternoon evening. Well, late afternoon, let's see if it goes into the late evening. On Thursday, we have closed admin and then go into open session at 9 a.m. We will be talking about COVID-19 test kits for the Sheriff's Department. FY23 preliminary recommended CIP and bond authorization will be presented to us from our Office of Management and Budget. I'm sure that open session will fill uh, from that point. On Friday 14th and Saturday 15th, we have nothing in the podcast. Commissioner Boucher will be uh, presenting on the 16th. Are there any corrections to that week? We're still monitoring the situation, Commissioner Rothstein, with MAKO. Uh, we're getting updated schedules as we speak, but Dennis and I will, will make sure that we get the right information there. Tentatively, they're trying mm. to get us down there, but um, I don't know that that's going to happen. So right now, everything's virtual, and the dates get to be a little wonky here. So we'll we'll update as needed. Okay. Wonky's my number <laughs> 2022. No, I, I get you. And... Uh... You know, we have been talking about session, session, legislative session does begin next Wednesday or this Wednesday coming up, uh, which will definitely be a challenge as, um, <laughs> besides it being a challenge, uh, it'll be an additional challenge with the virtual situation that they're gonna be going through. Um, on Monday the 17th, we are closed in the observance of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. <clears throat> on Tuesday, Local management board meeting. Uh, Commissioner Frazier will be attending. I have TBD on that, so we'll get that cleared up. Uh, planning commission. I'm pretty sure that's going to be virtual. Sorry. Yeah, no, sure I, that's I would expect so too. Planning commission, Commissioner Wance at 9 a.m. that morning, and then Commissioner Weaver and I will be attending the Veterans Advisory meeting, all being virtual. Uh, again, on Wednesday, the 19th, with MACO, the tax subcommittee meeting with Commissioner uh, Wance and Commissioner Frazier and Wance attending the MACO Legislative Committee weekly meeting. On Thursday, uh, January 20th, <clears throat> our open session again is scheduled for 9 a.m. And currently we have a pre-approval for the FY22 Annual Transportation Plan and public hearing 
uh, scheduled, and that is all. Uh, Roberta, what I would like is um, to get a, uh, a health update, um, either weekly or biweekly, and we can determine uh, the value of that. But I think it's important as we're moving through this, while the state is in a state of emergency, that we get those uh, understanding of the resources that we may need to uh, support, whether it's test testing, test kits, vaccinations, you know, what, what our health department is doing and uh, really appreciate the work they're doing. <clears throat> um, okay, Friday, January 21st, joint board of directors, BRTB meeting. Yeah, that's the that's the uh, oh, Baltimore, Baltimore Metropolitan. Baltimore so Metropolitan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. And Commissioner Wance will be attending that. I don't want to tell you what I was thinking when I saw Bravo Mike, but that's a different story. And I'll be doing the podcast on Sunday the twenty third. Sadly, I think I know what you were thinking. So <laughs> I okay. Um, is there anything further for this morning? I just have one question. Uh, last year, I think the word of the year was absurd. And this year, it seems to be wonky is the word coming in. Can we get a definition for wonky? <clears throat> it's whatever you want to make it there, Dickie. <laughs> well, the question is, is it a noun, a verb, an adjective? I mean, it, it could be many things, but we'll, again, okay. I'll, I'll work with staff to get back to you, Dickie. Mr. Swam, you are being, being entirely too quick, unlike my language. Okay, you can take that down. Anything further for the good of the group or our community? If not, I need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. I got a motion, I got a second. All in favor? Aye. Against four one. <laughs>